<laughs> we all know these family dinners, eh? Do we? Where not just the food is cooking, the emotions are cooking too. And so uh, it's a big honor to start this new series called Between Us. And it's a series over the next couple of weeks we're talking about relationships. And not just marriage relationships, but all kind of relationships. And so last weekend, for the ones who were here, we had our musical camp up. And in this musical, there were all different types and kinds of relationships happening. And I think the one relationship that, that really stood out was this relationship between the siblings, Miriam and Morris. And I mean, they played like the whole spectrum of relationship. They loved each other, they had fights, they missed each other, and they misunderstood each other. All the spectrum of relationship that we know was in these two people. And I think that one scene in the musical, one dance especially, pictured this spectrum of relationship very well. And I'm so happy that tonight we can see this dance again, performed by Joan and Ramon. They're themselves a married couple. And so that's why I think they can dance what it means to be in relationship with each other. So enjoy this dance between us. something between us. Sometimes it's love, sometimes it's disappointment, it's attraction, it's maybe wrong expectations, misunderstandings, indifference, sympathy, sometimes it's a yes, sometimes a no, sometimes a maybe. Relationships, it's often complicated. You know the status. It is complicated. And we all know that. Whether you're married or you have friends in your family, it can be very complicated to live in relationship. But still, relationships are crucial for our lives. They're so important to learn to live in healthy, close relationships. And I think God wants us to be able to live in healthy relationships. And that's why I think this series is an important series because uh, it's our topic. It's our everyday topic. We live in relationship with people and we want to learn over the next couple of weeks how to live relationship God's way. And so I want to start this series and start this message um, by first looking into the Bible. Uh, that's just the way I am. I just love to look into the Bible uh, and learn what the Bible and God tells us about relationships. So I want to first highlight this in a theological, biblical sense um, before we then move on. So if I look in my Bible... What we can see there is that before anything was created, there was something. There was God, of course, because God is, has no beginning and no end. But not just that, before everything was created, there was already relationship. I want to 
take you to the place in the Bible in Genesis 1 where God creates man. Uh, I want to read this verse in uh, chapter 1, verse 26, probably a verse that you have read and heard hundreds of times. And I want to highlight two little details that I think are very important when it comes to relationship, when we wanted to understand what the worth of relationship is for God. So let us look at this verse, Genesis 1, 26. And it says there, Then God said, Let us, and I want to highlight this, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So what we have here first is God speaking in plural, let us make. Some theologians say that this is the pluralis majestatis. For the ones who love to speak Latin, I thought I will bring you the right term. So the pluralis majestatis, yeah, it was, for, it was for you, actually, Nicolin, because Latin is very close to Bündner Deutsch. <laughs> so pluralis majestatis is the plural of highness. So, you know, like people who are very important, like people who are like kings and, and queens and have, uh, have power uh, and are very important. They're too important to speak just uh, singular. So they use the plural. So for instance, the, the Queen of England, when she's speaking about herself, she will say, we. We invite thee for tea. <laughs> yes, that's what she would say. Because she's way too important to just say, I, it's we. Um, so it's the plural of, um, of highness. And of course, God is the creator of everything. I mean, he's the, he's the king of kings. So of course, we can think that this is why he uses here us, because he's way too big, too important over everything. So we're using him the, the pluralis majestatis. So just for an advice, if I start speaking about myself in plural, you can smack me in the face, okay? <laughs> because then probably I'll just, uh, I just lost it, eh? I think um, that this is not the plural of ma majestatis, but it's talking about a God who in his core nature is relationship. We believe in a go God who is triune. We believe in a God who is three in one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is three person, three separate person, but one. It's, it's a concept that we can't really understand. But what it says to me is that God in his very nature is perfect relationship. That's what he is. It's a perfect relationship. There's no pecking order. It's no one fighting against the other. Who is first, second, third? Who is up? Where is down? No, it's three person in perfect relationship, in perfect subordination to each other. And so when God here says, let us make, he's speaking about this three person that decide to create someone they can relate to. Because it's interesting, uh, before God creates man, he creates the whole earth. And if you read the 26 or the 25 verses from the beginning of Genesis, he never uses the plural. Of, uh, the, the plural. It's only when he creates man. And so this is a very a special thing, and I think we need to look closely to this. The second thing that I showed is the image. Mankind is made in the image of God. The Hebrew word for image is zalem. Zalem. Zalem Elohim means uh, in the image of God. And zalem is a Hebrew word that is used to talk about the making of a statue. So when you're making a statue, you're using zalem, so the statue is more or less perfect replication of the original, is a statue. So zalem means this. And it's interesting that you and I were made in the image of God, and some chapters after that, God says to human being not to make an image of God. Now you know why, because you are the image of God. We are already the image of God, so there's no, no need to make an image of God because he decided to make you in his image and place you as his representative in this world to empower 
he, he empowers you with delegated authority to represent him on earth. You're a statue got from God. It's amazing. And this is unique in the whole creation. Only humans are made in the image of God, not the animals. And this is important in a time where sometimes the animals have almost the same worth like human being. I know it's not so politically correct to say this now, but I'll say it. Man stands above the animals. Only them are made in the image of God. Yes. Not the dogs, not the, you know, I love animals. We have two cats. <laughs> and one of them is pregnant. <laughs> you know, my wife found a new business model. So if you need a cat in June, I make good price. <laughs> I love my cats, but they're still cats. The unique thing about us is we are made in the image of God. And what does that say? It doesn't say that we look like God. It's not talking about the same appearance, but it talks about the nature. It talks about the nature. We have the capacity to live in relationship with God and others. I think this is the reason why God uses the plural here, because he wants to tell that we are relationship and man is made in our likeness. Human beings are made for relationships. Yeah. This is important that we understand. This is at the core of what God planned when he made you. And this is why in the next chapter, and understand, this is before the fall. We're still before the fall. The fall was in chapter 3. So we're still in a perfect world. Everything is perfect. God created everything. He said everything is good. It's, ve it's very good even when he made man. But then in the next chapter, we zoom in into the creation of man. And we read there in Genesis 2, uh, the following Let's look at this, at this verse. It says there, The Lord God said, it is not good. It is not good. So everything is perfect. No sin in the world, but still something is not good. It is not good. What is not good for the man to be alone? So you see, man is created for relationship. And we can only become really human in relationship with others. It's not good for men to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And what comes after that is, is funny. I, I think it's funny because then Adam goes out into the garden. He looks at all the animals, gives them names. And then we read in verse 20... So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. You know what? I'm so happy that he didn't come back with a chimpanzee. Like, hey, I find a guy. Does that look suitable for me? Or maybe a, a giraffe or an elephant? You know, when, when, I, when I conduct weddings, I'm always thinking about that, you know. Who is walking through the aisle, you know? I'm so happy that he didn't find a suitable helper within the animals. So God had to create Isha, woman. But not just woman, he created human. So that there, this relationship that was implanted into us from the beginning can live. And so this is major that we understand this topic of relationship is so important. And that's why I think this is so a, such a battlefield, you know, that the thing that can be the biggest blessing for us can be the, the biggest curse. Because this is really something that is so deep in our nature, in the nature of God. And so it's crucial that we know how to live healthy relationship, that we pr prioritize our working on relationship because this is at the very heart of God. And so maybe you might say, okay, this is, this is what the Bible says, but uh, you know, the Bible says lots of things. I want to I wanna know what the science is saying, what is important for our life. I'm happy that you asked me the question. 
so I can give you a good answer. Um, because I have uh, come along a study, uh, a scientific study that will uh, exactly confirm what the Bible says. And, you know, I love that because this is the way it should be. Science has to confirm what is written in the Bible. Otherwise, I have a problem. You know what I mean? Because our God is maker of everything. So, you know, we are all looking for the good life. And what are we calling a good life? Good life is a fulfilled, a happy life. We all want a happy life. We all want a life where we feel fulfilled. And so there was a study conducted um, within some uh, millennials. Millennials are people who were born around the millennial. That's why they're called like this. And they were asked, what do you think will give you the good life? What do you need in life to be fulfilled? Now you have to listen to that. 80% of the millennials in this study, I don't say that all millennials say that, but 80% of these people said, I want to become rich. If I'm rich, if I have money, I'll be fulfilled. 50% said, I want to be famous. Rich and famous. If I have these two things, my life will be happy. My life will be fulfilled. So it's all about status. It's all about what I have who I am. And you know, the interesting thing is whole society tells us that you exactly have to chase after these two things and you will make it. Right. So it's kind of a life between rose petals and golden buzzers. Yes. <laughs> I know. I need a golden buzzer sometime. Maybe I should install one and then if I'm preaching, you just like bang. Or maybe you would never push it anyway. But, you know, when you think about that, The Bachelor, it's, it's a series about relationship, really? Is this the way we think relationship should work? You have these 20 guys with more or less muscles and this one girl, and I'm looking at this and think, how come? Is it not maybe that these people are chasing these five minutes of glory, you know, like these five minutes of fame, that maybe through the famous person they could hang to, they could maybe make it into the headlines. And, but who remembers the name of any bachelor from the last couple of years? I'm not so sure about it. And Golden Buzzer, you know, all this um, America and uh, whoever is looking for a super talent. It's the same thing, it's about fame, it's about how can I come to the top so that people see me. And so if I'm famous, and because I'm famous, I will get rich, and so I will have the happy life. You know, I was thinking last weekend, there was golden buzzer like all the time for our musical. I think these guys did such a great job. But it's so cool to see this is a group of people. It's not about me. Look at me. It's about, hey, what can we create as a group to make the name of God great? And this is what touches our hearts because it's not me, 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 bring the rain, the gold. It's about more than that. And so I read this study. It's called the Grant Study or it's the, also called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And it's one of the longest, uh, a study that has um, um, been going for the last 75 and more years. The study started in 1938. And this is very rare for a scientific study. Lots of studies go for a couple of years or maybe some decades. But the study that is conducted over 75 years is majors. And in this story, they were exam examining uh, happiness. How can people become happy? And so it started in 1938. One part of the people um, were um, people who went through Harvard University. So they were from families that had a, a good status and, 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 uh, and, and good money, probably. And then the other part were teenagers from the poorest families in Boston. So we have a total of uh, something uh, over 700 people that over their whole life, over 75 and more years, scientists have examined their lives. They have examined their health development, their successes and failures in career and marriage. And so by the day, there's still 60 of these people living and they're continuing the studies with their children. 
So we see this study over, since 1938, people have been examined and we, they watched their life. And they, they looked at the development of their life and tried to find out what gives them the success, what gives them health over the long run. And so the fourth director, it's, they have already the fourth director because the other three, I don't know, maybe they died or they just were fed up by this. But the fourth and actual director is called Robert Waldinger. He's a psychiatrist. And he summarizes the, fin the main findings of the study as follows. Happiness is love, full stop. And he says, when we grow old, our lives are the sum of all our loves. That's the main finding of the longest study, scientific study. It's not a Christian study. It's not some pastors who made a study. It's scientists from Harvard University. So they are respected scientists. And they came up with that. And I have another um, quote from Waldinger, he said the following, the surprising finding, he said, get that, the surprising finding that is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships have a powerful influence on our lives and health. Why is that so surprising to him? Maybe because he doesn't know the Bible too well. Because if you know your Bible, you wouldn't be so surprised about this finding. Because there's, for instance, a verse in Ecclesiastes 4. And it's interesting, the writer of Ecclesiastes was probably Solomon. And Solomon was a wise man. He was a scientist before his age. And how did he do science? He was, he was looking at the world. He was looking at at the seasons, at how nature is working. And through that, lots of wisdom came out of him. So he did the same thing like the scientist from Howard. He was looking at the world and he had some observation. And through this observation, then had some findings. And so he writes, Ecclesiastes 4, 7, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. This is exactly what this study says. It's not about status. It's not about what you have. It's not about money. It's not about fame. It's about love. It's about relationships. I love it when science confirms the Bible. <laughs> I just love that because it's just no other arguments against that. So I just want to give you the main findings of the study. It says there are good and close relationships and not money and status keep us healthy and happy. They have more influence. Now listen, they have more influence than social status, IQ or even our genes. Even our genes have not more influence on our healthy life than healthy relationships. So now I read this proverb 1517 in a whole different light. It says there, better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. Yes. <laughs> so if there is love, even vegetables is good to eat. Because it's not about what is on the table, it's what is on the other side of the table. It's about what is in between. It's not about like the biggest steak will make a good evening. It's about our relationship. Yeah. You know, I prefer love and meat, <laughs> if I can choose. Last week I had date night with my wife and yeah, there was some vegetable asparagus things on the menu, but I chose entrecote because love was already there. <laughs> so, so if love is there, eat meat. No problem with that. And I hope all the vegetarians forgive me for that. But yeah, so it's not about status. It's not about how big the meat is on your table. It's about 
the relationship with the person you're sitting at the table. This is profound. And this is, again, the Bible says the way it is. Then people who are well connected with friends, family and community are happier, healthier and live longer. It's interesting that people, during the, the, the whole um, survey, people who, when they were 50, said they were happy with their relationship, were the ones who were the healthier when they were 80. So they, they belong to the healthier group when they were 80, when they were happy with their relationship with 50. So we see that there is, there is power in healthy relationship. And again, Exodus 20, 12 says the following, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. This is the first command that has a promise. If you honor your parents, it will have a positive impact on your life. You know, this morning I had the opportunity in the 11 celebration to honor my parents. This is something that I really plan to do for many weeks. My parents, they celebrate their 50 years anniversary this year. And you see my mother, my father, <laughs> my father, uh, He's working like, he's enjoying it. Uh, I, had, I had like this table set up, a place of honor. And I really, you know, like, uh, and I mean, I, mean, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I am who I am today because of them. Because they invested into me. Because they tirelessly just spoke word of life into me. And this is so powerful, you know. They're a big example for me, for our marriage. They have been married for 15 years, uh, 50 years, not 15, 50 years. They just hang in it, you know. And they just... They're, they're strong, like they're, they're traveling around the world. They're always like somewhere. Are they, where are you? Yeah, we are uh, on a boat somewhere. You know, they're enjoying life. And I so love that because that's what the Bible says, you know. It's so powerful if we, if we invest into each other and also if we honor our parents. I think there's a big promise, the Bible says. And you know, when it comes to relationships, it's not about the quantity of the relationship. It's about the quality of our relationships that is crucial. And so, good relationship also protect our brain. This is what the study says. So people who lived in good relationship when they were 80, they had a better capacity of uh, remembering things. So it has really a positive impact on our life. And what the study also says is that loneliness kills. Loneliness is toxic and shortens our life. And I read an article this week in the Tagesanzeiger, and I have it here, it's in German, but you would uh, maybe understand what it says. In Zurich, once a month, you can cuddle with strangers for three hours. <laughs> and it's really cuddling. It's not, uh, you know, it's uh, all safe, but it's cuddling with strangers. <laughs> And uh, you know what happens when you cuddle with someone? This is happening. You know that. You know what that is? Of course you know. This is the cuddle hormone, the love hormone. It's oxytocin. You should know that. That's a hormone that is spilled into your body if there's contact happening with other people. And so you can cuddle. And it said there... Is this the answer to loneliness in the time of internet working? Internet networking, you know? And it's interesting, you know, it said there that 30% of people in Zurich say that they feel lonely. Loneliness is really something that our society is really um, is sick from. And so we see how important relationship is. The good life is built with good relationship. And so, of course, we all want the good life, but we all want also the quick success. We would love to have the golden buzzer and go directly into the finals, but we know relationship is hard work. We, had, we have to hang in there. And the key for healthy relationship is liability, faithfulness. These are the things that help us grow into healthy relationship. And so, Tonight I want to close this message by having my best friend on stage. So give a, a hand to Joseph as he jumps on stage like a young uh, whatever. <laughs> Joseph and me, we have been best friends for um, almost 20 years. And so Joseph, when it comes to relationship, 
your upbringing and uh, you come from a from a difficult place when it comes to relationship. Tell us a little bit where you're coming from. Yep, that's a real hard topic for me when I remember how it was when I was a boy. Because I have grown up on a small farm. I had three, I still have three sisters. Um, that sounds like happy life, but it wasn't because from my point of view, most uh, because of my father, because he used to drink a lot. And when he was drunk, he was aggressive. He used to beat me, sometimes with reason, sometimes without. Sometimes it became that serious that it ended up uh, at the doctor. So I had to find out how I wanted uh, to, let's call it, survive under these circumstances. So I withdrew myself, I tried to protect myself, I couldn't complain to anyone. Whom should I have to complain? To, uh, should I have complained to? For sure not to my father, to, for, to my mother. That was, that was no way as, as well because she also suffered. So I just withdrew, um, but I began to feel uh, lonely more and more. That's, uh, you know, that's how I began to become depressed back then. And then, as I said, about 20 years ago, um, I met you. And so what, where were you? What was your, yeah, what was your status at, the, at that moment when we met? Yeah, well, I think all of us, we know he's a very lucky guy. And uh, I think this uh, moment proves it. You met me after my, after my worst time. Because as I said, uh, I became depressive. And at the end, uh, for weeks and months, my only thinking was about when, where, and how will I commit suicide. And uh, that's how I was brought to a psychotic clinic at the end. And when we met, that was short after I had left the psychiatric clinic. Yeah, that's when we met. And now we've been friends for 20 years, so what, what was different now in the last 20 years that we're still friends, that you didn't run away? Are you honest now? Do we remember when I ran away again? I think uh, your wife told me that you suffered when I withdrew me uh, myself once again for one year. I refused to answer your calls just to get into a conversation to you for one year. I fell back to my early well-known habits. But when we met, I remember that one. I was part of your worship team and I really remember you were the one who decided with this guy, I really don't know why he has chosen me, but he decided with this guy, I want to build up a relationship. And I know, now I know, back then you told to yourself, this guy is hurt seriously about relationship. But there, there is a healer. There is a power of healing. And sometimes this healer uses relationships to heal someone. And that's how you took me on this journey. And you know, what I love about this journey is that Joseph got married last year. And this is really something that touches my heart because I remember when I first met you, I told you, I will, I will marry you. Uh, not I will marry you. <laughs> Not I will marry you, I will, I will uh, conduct a, mar a marriage with someone. Uh, you marry someone and I'll conduct the wedding. <laughs> I won't marry you. I'm already married to a beautiful wife. Um, and, and now to see this happening just touches my heart because I see how God really healed your heart during that time. And so now you are able to live friendship with others too. This is great. And I think this is a great message, you know, in this whole series. The Bible tells us that relationship is something powerful. And not just the Bible tells us, but also the science says that relationship 
is the key for a happy life. And so I pray that over this series, we will be motivated to hang in to our relationship. And maybe while I was preaching, there's some names coming up to mind. Maybe some family things, you know, that maybe your relationship to your mother, to your father is difficult, or friends or that have left you or you have left them through some conflicts. And I pray that during this series, we'll have the courage to go after these relationships and to understand the power of close relationships. And I want to close with Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, because it sums up what the Bible says about relationship. It says there, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You know, this is powerful, this last verse, because it really says that if we have God in the midst of our relationships, this is how our relationship can work. We love because God first loved us. And I want to close this message with a prayer. I want to ask Joseph to pray for relationships. I want, I want to ask him to pray for maybe family relationship. I mean, it's a powerful story. If you hear his story, his relationship to his father and how God could heal this. I believe God can do this in your life. This is your story. And so let, let's, let's close our eyes and, and Joseph will pray first and then I'll pray also and we'll just invite the Holy Spirit to come into our relationship and to, to engage into his power that he has for us. Heavenly Father, you know, you know how I was laughing at Nick when he said about 20 years ago, one day I will get you married. You know how I couldn't believe it. But you have proven you're faithful. You can heal every relationship. You can heal every broken heart. You have proven it in my life and you will prove it over and get over and over again in everybody everybody's life who will dare to trust in you and that's why i ask you lord send friends to each and everyone in here who is need who is in need of a friendship and i also ask you for for that, that the people will dare to go anew into a new relationship because you are the one who can heal and you are the one who will begin something but you are also the one who will bring it to a good end in Jesus name yes Lord you have made us for relationship and I pray for for our relationship with our parents, with our sisters, brothers, with our friends, with our work colleagues. I pray for every relationship that is under attack at the moment, where people have betrayed us, where people have run away, where people have withdrawn from us, or we have withdrawn. Lord Jesus, I pray that over the next couple of weeks you will bring healing. You will bring healing. You will give us hope that we can live in healthy, close relationships. I thank you, Lord, for the power of relationship. I thank you, Lord, that we can love because you loved us first. It's because we're filled with your love that we can love others in return. And I just pray that you're pouring out your love into our lives, your love that is unconditional. We are called your friends because you have chosen us to be your friends. And I just pray that this revelation is going deep down into our hearts and helps us in our everyday relationships with people. In the name of Jesus, I pray.
you have all got this card on your chair and uh, I'll just encourage you if God spoke to your heart through this message maybe it's a name maybe it's a situation maybe it's anything that God has brought into your heart into, into your mind write it down and write down your next steps you know this relationship is all about growing growing into healthy relationship and I pray that this night was start to something great so write it down hang it to your fridge wherever so you can pray about it over the next couple of weeks and let's stand up to our feet and just praise God I mean he's the maker of everything he's your friend he loves you and he wants the best for you he wants you to have the happy life and so let's let's worship him Let's celebrate his love and his goodness over our lives. Your love never fails. God, I will trust your sovereignty when there is no clarity because I can't sit forever in my disappointment and pain. I'm going to stand. Fear loves to live with you. Fear loves to keep you where you are. Fear wants you to do what you have always done and never do anything else. Fear wants to shackle your potential and fear always wants to limit you. Jesus, I'm afraid. Jesus, let's do it. And there are moments when you are in a ladder, when you are facing an area where you're super afraid, don't give up.